Good morning, Georgiana. I hope this finds you doing well this Sunday morning. Uh, we are glad to be coming into your homes and to sharing and sharing the gospel in the church with you this morning. Uh, we've got a couple of things going on around here that uh, you may be interested in participating in. It's hard to believe, but Vacation Bible School is a week away. Uh, we had moved it out uh, from a month ago to a few weeks out, so uh, we're ready to have children on our campus and to be blessing them and sharing the gospel with them. And so if you have wanted to volunteer for Vacation Bible School, or you have volunteered for Vacation Bible School but have not returned to Live Church, we just need you to know that there's a training session that is going to happen here on our campus on July 20th and 22nd at 6 p.m. You just need to attend one or other or the other of these two meetings. So again, on the 20th and the 22nd, at 6 p.m. in the Fishing 56 room. You can register for that training online if you would. Also, we are about three weeks away from our Cambridge outreach, uh, which we do for the local elementary school in our community, uh, Cambridge Elementary. And so we invite everybody in the church uh, every other year uh, to help us provide a backpack for every child at Cambridge filled with their grade appropriate school supplies. So every child, 600 plus children, will receive a backpack with their school supplies. So generally what this costs is about $75. So we want to offer you the opportunity uh, to help us do this community outreach and service by uh, giving you a chance to buy a backpack virtually. Uh, so you can uh, go on PayPal and just designate $75 for Cambridge backpacks. Or if you want to do two or three, uh, just do the math, $150, $225, whatever that is. And we would love to have you participate with us as we share in this community outreach. You can also send a check to the church. Uh, just make a note at the bottom that it is for backpacks, and we will see to it that you help us purchase a backpack for a child uh, to begin the school year. There is nothing cooler than watching children receive a brand spanking new backpack and then watch their eyes light up as they open it and see it filled with all their school supplies. Not to mention what a blessing this is for their families. Also, we want to share with you that we still have a number of people in our church struggling and suffering with COVID virus. We have uh, people in our church community that are in the hospital, and so uh, we have uh, one that's trying to wean off a ventilator. We have a huge, huge need, uh, literally in our community, and then, and then also with people in our church who have loved ones in other states that are also in the hospital. So I ask you this morning as we enter into a time of prayer, that we would be focused on this virus that has yet again raised its head. I think we all kind of got lulled into thinking that it was behind us, but it has raised its head. So we just ask that you be in prayer for these families and uh, our communities, wherever you live, uh, to protect it from the virus. So won't you join me in prayer right now? Gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning and we, we surrender and submit to you that we are not in control. So, Father, we ask that you would guide us this morning as we hear a word from you, as we hear a command from you. Father, we're mindful of everyone in our community who is uh, struggling, suffering, hospitalized, living in the shadow of this horrible, horrible virus. So, Father, we pray protection over our community. We pray protection over those that have not yet had it. We pray protection over those that are unvaccinated. We pray protection over family members uh, as their loved ones have it and deal with it. Father, we pray that you would open doors so families can be together in these difficult times, even in the midst of hospitalizations. Uh, Father, we just pray uh, with all the wisdom and all the discernment in the world that you would help us navigate again the waters of this virus. Uh, so, Father, we know that all things are possible with you, and so we trust you uh, in this sense. So, Father, we also... I think about the civil unrest in Cuba. Uh, Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and the churches in Cuba as they continue to live in the face of serious oppression from the government. We pray for the country of Haiti. We pray protection over our daughters as they are in a season of transition. Uh, so, Father, with all things, we come to you and ask that you be present where we cannot be present, that you would be active where we cannot be active. We pray your spirit comes. So, Father, we give you all the glory for the day that we have, for the ministries that are lying in front of us in the weeks ahead, Vacation Bible School, Backyard Missions, uh, just every good thing that is happening, the Cambridge Outreach. Father, we ask that you bless that so that we don't fall short 
of the 600 backpacks. So Father, we pray these things as a church, as a community, as a body of Christ, uh, both virtual and live. And we pray all these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. All right, Georgiana, let's jump into what God has for us this morning. Uh, I want to take a moment and thank Ryan Beavers, our new associate pastor, for the amazing job that he did last Sunday in preaching a great, great sermon on uh, that uh, Jesus is the real deal. I loved his metaphors. I loved his analogies. Uh, he just had a great debut message uh, for the beginning of his ministry here for he and Allie and Zoe, and so we're super indebted uh, to them and to uh, God for bringing them into our lives. So we're thankful for that. I know that you'll be seeing a lot of him in the future. Uh, today, we pick back up on our summer series, Command and Control, looking at the unique Christian tension that we are a people under authority of one Lord, but struggle with obedience as we wrestle for control, right? We, we said a couple of weeks ago that we struggle with control issues. I find as I read scriptures that Jesus doesn't stutter or stammer or hesitate when he gives his commands. Jesus creates no moral ambiguity when he speaks. You don't need a telescope, a horoscope, or a microscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of a universe without him. The thing is, is we don't need many truths to govern our lives. We need one truth that governs all the motivations and actions of our lives. God in Scripture has not been vague. He doesn't create confusion about his creation. He is crystal clear about sexuality and marriage and work ethic and honoring our parents in worship and being generous and keeping the Sabbath and coveting and violence. We have been called by God to fill this moral vacuum created by generations of sin with a timeless truth and of unfailing love that is both evident and radiant in the world we live in. Today, we're going to take the scriptures in big chunks, but first, a little background that you've heard many times from this pulpit, so I'll try to abbreviate it for you. There is no specific definition in the Bible for the term Christian. The word Christian only occurs three times in the Bible, and each time it is used by those on the outside in reference to people on the inside. And mostly it is used in a derogatory way. To be called a Christian was an insult in the first century. Jesus never called his followers Christians. In fact, the term came into being way, way, way after his death. So now here we are. Here we are, 21st century Christians, and how this term is interpreted means something different virtually to everyone you ask and everyone who hears it. As we know, Jesus called his followers disciples, which turns out does have a biblical definition. Here's the definition from John 13, 34 through 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. A godly love for one another is a characteristic of a true disciple of Jesus or a student of the master. Here's what's fascinating to me. Severe persecution took place under Nero in 65 AD, but it couldn't stamp out this movement even as small as it seemed to be in that season because they were serious. They were serious about following Jesus and loving others. Again, he called them disciples, not Christians. Followers were being persecuted and killed readily for the first 300 years of Christendom. Then a persevering love and a never-quit spirit of God created a breakthrough moment, and Christianity would become the religion of the known world in its days, and crosses would be displayed everywhere in Rome and on buildings and walls and everywhere you walked, in honor of this one man, Jesus Christ. Now think about it for a moment. From near obliteration to total assimilation in three to four generations, this means not only was it not stamped out, but it was also successfully passed from generation to generation under extreme duress. 
How does something like this happen? Well, it's not because they all decided one day to be Christians. They took seriously Jesus' teaching and the label he gave them, which was disciples or students. This small cult of Jesus followers made all the difference in the world. The band of followers of Jesus, who many thought would bring political change and bring military change, would not become what everyone thought they would become. Why not? Because they took seriously the teachings of Jesus. So what did Jesus teach them? Well, here's what's crazy. The very teaching of Jesus that was so countercultural in its day then is also hard for American Christians to swallow and submit to today. It is ironic, isn't it, that the very teachings of Jesus that was just countercultural, hard to hear, even today is hard for us. So we treat the commands of Jesus like a buffet where we self-select the boundaries of our obedience. Listen, ours is a tough, rugged, and wicked world. Aggression, rebellion, violence, cutthroat competition, and retaliation abound. We see civil war in South Africa, uprisings in Cuba over years and years of governmental oppression, assassinations in Haiti, Christian persecution and martyrdom in Western Africa. Heck, even flying now, even flying now has just become a combat cage match at 30,000 feet. You can't get on a plane without the threat of somebody going ballistic or nuts or something. This is the world we're living in. It's everywhere, and I, that, I venture no one would argue this, but it's not just internationally or in big cities. It is also happening personally to people around you, and maybe, and maybe even to you. There is a rebellion in people's hearts these days as they live in this confusing world. It was the prophet Jeremiah that declared, but these people are stubborn and have rebellious hearts, for they have turned aside and have gone away from the Lord. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the Bible is as relevant today as it has ever been in its history. These are timeless truths that the church mostly ignores. Listen, what is true in the secret council chambers of nations is also true behind the doors, closed doors of our homes. We are a stubborn, warring people. Outside of riots and actual war, studies have concluded the most dangerous place to be in the 21st century is in the home. It's the most dangerous place is in the home. With domestic violence and child abuse on the rise in a hard and hostile society, it's easy, it's easy for us to slip into despair and wonder what possible influence the servants of Christ, servants of Christ can have. This is how hope gets abandoned. We see only the darkness and we forget, we forget. We are the lights. We are the lights. One of the things that I've been repeating for the last six months is God wastes nothing. God wastes nothing. God didn't waste our downtime, our quarantine time. God wastes nothing. The good, the bad, the overwhelming. He is using all of it to gird up his people for the work of the mission ahead. Nothing, nothing in the kingdom of God is ever wasted. So here's Jesus' speech that started the entire movement. The value system that would turn the world upside down. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. It becomes the catalyst for radical thinking that we intended, that was intended to be countercultural. Nothing about the Jesus movement was about to, was about conforming to the culture. But the truth, but the truth is today that the values of the culture and the values of who, those who call themselves Christian are eerily similar. Culture and those who call themselves Christian, eerily similar. This is the message. Just being a Christian isn't cutting it these days. Jesus is calling for and looking for disciples. So if you have your Bibles with you at home, open to the book of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 12, and then we're going to pick it up in 13 here in a few minutes. The beginning of the whole ministry starts here. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. This is, this is where it gets sticky. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. 
because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is Jesus' launch to his ministry. If you, if you think about it, I think you have to hear it. You have to hear it from the perspective of a first century Jew or Gentile sitting on a hill waiting to hear a message of deliverance. And then you get this from him, from Jesus. You get, blessed are the meek. Are you kidding me? The meek are getting their fannies handed to them. The meek are getting devoured, chewed up, and spit out in the first century. And then Jesus comes along and talks about peacemakers. Seriously, like if you looked around, we are under Roman oppression. We're not looking for peacemaking. We're looking for revolution. They understand that this is the launch of something new. But let us get it straight, they say. We are poor, sad, meek, righteous, merciful, pure, peaceful, persecuted, and insulted, and that we're going to have to live with delayed gratification before we get our reward in heaven. It feels more like bringing a pillow to a nuclear war or to a gunfight. So what did all this mean? It meant that this was going to be a movement that was more about plowshare than sword, more about grace than self-gratification, and more about love than fear. It meant that those who held to his teachings were a part of a seismic shift, one where Jesus would be front and center. Crosses are going to be everywhere. They're going to be in Rome, in Washington, in Moscow, in Saigon, in secret churches in China and all over the world. And it was disciples that did this, not Christians. These beatitudes were not a prescription for blessing, but a description of a blessed disciple. It is not a to-do list. It is a good news list. What if the kind of revival that we've been talking about this year is what we are willing to do, what we are willing to sacrifice so that the church will be here for our great-grandchildren? Could we do that? Could we do that? Could we sacrifice to that level so the church would still be here for our great-grandchildren? Could we, could we delay gratification like the first century Christians did? Jesus says, if you're going to be this kind of disciple, then it's going to take being salt and light. And here we have the command. Pick it up in verse 13. Very first thing Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Then he says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, he says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He's talking about salt. Well, salt is a preservative. What is a preservative? It's a substance added to food to prevent decomposition due to chemical change or bacterial action. Without a preservative, things rot, things stink. You know this to be true. If the power ever goes out for extended days like those hurricane days, when your power goes out and you come back and you open your refrigerator, which was created to what? Extend the preservation life of food. It was intended to replace salt. You open that refrigerator and it stinks to high heaven. Anyone who has opened a bloated, expired jug of milk knows the smell we're talking about. What Jesus is talking about is avoiding the smell of decay emanating from your life from spiritual spiritual just ob oblivion from just ignoring your spiritual life. Just before COVID, we were in Haiti and they were having problems with their freezer and we were trying to evaluate if the freezer needed to be replaced or if it needed to be repaired or what was going on. I know, I know I'm the least, least qualified guy in our church to be examining and doing this job, but I was the one that was there. So here was my job that day. We got up that morning, I was gonna go look at the freezer, but because the power goes on and off, frequently, and the generator doesn't run all the time to conserve fuel, the freezer is constantly in a state of running and not running, melting and refreezing. So when you opened it, it really was one giant solid block of ice. So I had to take a hammer and an ice pick and a screwdriver and start manually defrosting the freezer in an attempt to salvage any food that was in there. Now, as I begin the process, I'm about a half hour into this, I soon to begin to tack an odor of some kind emanating from the freezer. And the longer I hammered and got into things, the worse it got. It was the smell of rotting fish. Now I know there is no fish in that freezer. I have made 40 plus trips to Haiti in my lifetime and I have never seen a fish on the menu. 
But what, whatever was in there was seriously rancid. I began to find some moldy meat, and I'd smell it. That's not the smell. And there were gray hot dogs in there, which is Chris Rodriguez's favorite delicacy when we go to Haiti is gray hot dogs. And it's all going out. I'm just taking it and putting it in the trash. So I'm down to the last big square section in the middle of the freezer. And by this point, I am gagging, gagging and I'm swallowing back bile and I'm holding my breath when I finally break free this massive block of ice to reveal about 20 fish heads. 20 fish heads. Lord, have mercy. So I shout at Madame Delva to come and, and I said, what in the name of Jesus are these fish heads doing in the freezer, and I'm about to throw them in the trash can. And she grabs them and says, no, 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 fish head soup. These are for fish head soup. And I thought, not tonight. <laughs> I'm not having that. Not tonight, I say. She takes these fish heads and puts them in another freezer. I just tell you this because mission work is not for the faint of heart, right? Here's the spiritual takeaway just as Ryan shared last week. If your idea of spiritual commitment is being here a couple of weeks a month, or you, if you regularly kind of turn on your spiritual life, then turn off your spiritual life for long periods of times, and that your obedience to Christ is kind of here and there, then eventually what is inside of you will begin to rot. Not right away, mind you. But as things come under pressure, or as things heat up, the stink of spiritual decay will soon come to the surface because you were never designed to be separated from the power of the Holy Spirit. You were not designed to be ever separated from a holy God. Ever. Not ever. Think about this. If you're, if you're an average Christian, according to the survey that Ryan shared with us last week, that means you get two hours of Jesus a month. And in that very same month, you are simultaneously exposed to 150,000 ads. Two hours of Jesus a month, 150,000 ads in a month. Who do you think is winning the influence game? The world or Jesus? Who do you think is getting the most exposure of your heart? The world or Jesus? Church, we're just saying this morning that being a disciple is not a part-time thing, not a sometime thing. It's an all-time thing. And if you live with one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world, well, fish heads is what is your spiritual life will eventually smell like. And then Jesus says, Jesus says, we are the salt of the earth, the preservative. We are the preservatives of goodness in our homes and we are in our circles of influence. We are the preservative of earth. If we give up, if we ignore our role, well, we are now witnessing, I think, throughout the world how bad things can get. Look at the world, human trafficking, slavery, genocide. How can this be? There are 2.3 billion Christians in the world. Where's the salt? Where's the light? Maybe the problem is, is that there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world, but there aren't 2.3 billion disciples. Maybe that's the problem. Jesus makes it clear, if salt loses its saltiness, it is worthless. I believe it is impossible to, impossible to empirically argue against that on the whole. The evidence is so much of Christianity has completely lost its saltiness. And what's happened is that we've gotten to a place where we're great at belief. We are great at belief, but have not been transformed by what we say we believe. And so in the end, no matter what you want to look at numerically, whether it's marriages or debt, or how we spend our money, or how we give generously, you can empirically look across the line, and we are either no better than, or even in some cases worse than those who don't believe at all. Again, how, how is this possible? And so the Bible says in the end, if you have mastered information, but you haven't mastered life, then who cares? If in the end, you can systematically and theologically unpack all the mysteries of God, but you've been completely unmoved by them, who cares? And then in the end, the text says that what happens when you have belief but no transformation is that you get to be the punchline on social media. That's what you get. Because what ends up happening is we run our mouths, but there's no transformation to support our running mouths. So the church completely loses its place in the culture and ends up being disrespected, and ends up being mocked, and ends up being shamed. Because although what we believe is right, and what we believe is true, 
when there is no transformation, then people can't look and go, maybe, maybe, maybe there's something to them. Maybe there's something here. I just am saying this morning that there is no shortage of I believe, but there's been no substantive transformation in the children of God. And so we now live in a world where the church is losing its saltiness. It's on the verge of becoming worthless. And if revival does not occur, there is a danger that it gets thrown out to be trampled by men, which is what we are seeing right now in our country. Listen, you don't have to like this. You just can't argue against it. It's empirically true. Then Jesus finishes up when he says, you are the light of the world, a city placed on a hill that cannot be hidden. You, church, I'm telling you this morning, are strategically placed entity. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are strategically a strategically placed lighthouse of God. You are and have become a beacon on a hill intended to shine so others can see. Our light... Our light is not just for us. It is for others. If you use your light only for you, then you, by very definition, are not a disciple. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. What we do, what we do for God makes a difference. We are meant to be living witnesses to our community. We are workers. We are bosses. We are church members. We are members of a gym. We are part of a social group. We were meant to have influence. God placed you in these circles to have influence. Our actions are meant to outshine the darkness. I give a talk uh, at leadership workshops, workshops entitled Blinded by the Darkness, Blinded by the Darkness. The premise is that the encroaching moral decays and darkness settles over us so subtly that without any awareness, that then before you know it, you no longer can see good from evil. You can no longer see joy from sadness. You can no longer see darkness from light. You become blinded to the very thing sent by the enemy to destroy you. And before you know it, you can't see to find your way through it. Blinded by darkness is the only way that you can explain the overwhelming presence of cynicism and pessimism and sarcasm and narcissism in this world. I love the quote that says, first we overlook evil, then we permit evil, then we legalize evil, then we promote evil, then we celebrate evil, then we persecute those who still call it evil. Welcome to America. Welcome to America. This this is the story that is being written right now. A number of years ago, I heard Pastor Mike Slaughter say, when we privatize our faith, we cease being salt and light in the world no longer part of a countercultural revolution or an outpost of heaven demonstrating God's plan for restoration and, and resurrection, we reduce our faith to this. Jesus came, died, and rose from the grave to get me into heaven and the hell with everyone else. And the hell with everyone else. So who are we? What are we to be? Well, we are salt and light. We shouldn't settle for just being Christians. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, and we follow a different standard. Jesus anticipated that so far reaching would be the influence of his servants in society, that their presence would be as significant as salt on food and light in the darkness. I point out this morning that neither is loud or externally impressive, but both are essential. Without our influence in the world, it would soon be, we would soon begin to realize our absence. Seriously, right? Without our influence in the world, it would soon begin to realize our absence. Even though it may not admit it, our society needs both salt and light. Imagine, if you will, what would happen at Cambridge if Georgiana ceased to exist. Or in Haiti with 20 of our beautiful daughters. What would happen if Georgiana ceased to exist? Or to any number of worldwide parachurch ministries We are called to be salt to a bland world and light to those who are lost. These two attributes are distributed blessings, not hoarded gifts. Jesus is saying, you're the world's preservative. Without you, everything rots, culture stinks. He also told them that, and and told them and us that we are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop, visible all around, day and night. Church, you were... You are where you are by God's design. It is not by accident or circumstances. 
It is part of God's plan for you. Wherever you are, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's not about what people think of us. It's about glorifying God with this one and only life that you're ever going to get. People shouldn't be saying, oh, what a nice person. It has to be way, way more than that. They should see our good works as something that is extraordinary, that God is the only way that you can explain it. Be salt. Be light. Let your lifestyle point a way to Jesus. Each of us, each of us in this room, each of us who hear this story online, each of us in the virtual church has a story of how someone was salt and light to us. And that's how we got to Jesus. Somebody else was salt and light to us. And you know what's funny is that person might not even know it. But they were salt and light so that you could be with Jesus. Church, what I'm calling for this morning is a radically different way of thinking about our world. Instead of running from it, we need to rush into it. And instead of just hanging around the fringes of our culture, we need to be right smack dab in the middle of it. Remember, our job as disciples is not to protest, but to proclaim. You've got something to proclaim that is beautiful and good and is world-changing. In our circles, Christians are thought of as people who are against things. Disciples are known as people who are for things, good things, wholesome things, creative, wonderful, and fulfilling things. This is the message of the gospel, and it is the responsibility of being salt and light. Church, our own happiness, our own peace, can never be fully complete according to this book until we find some way of sharing it with people who the way things are right now have no happiness and know no peace. This is the ministry of salt and light that sees misery and can stand it no longer. That sees those caught in sex trafficking and can stand it no longer. To see those that are paralyzed with uncertainty, with an unplanned pregnancy, and can stand it no longer. Church, this is what it looks like to be salt and light. Followers of Jesus are to be salt and light in this world, to seek justice for the poor and the oppressed, and to bring hope to those without it. This is something that is countercultural, especially for those of us who live in one of the most decadent societies that has ever existed. You preach a sermon like this, and people, man, they don't get it. <laughs> because their world they live in doesn't reinforce this kind of message. And here's our reminder. Only you can do surgery on your soul. Only you. No one else on earth can know the full truth. You can cover it up. You can twist the facts in your mind. You can whitewash it. You can rationalize it. You can ignore the truth, and no one will ever know the difference. No one except you and the God that created you. We were made to preserve a holy way of life, and we were made to shine brightly. Anything less than this is on us. It is on us. Listen, every pastor I know will tell you that this is the single most challenging time to be the church in modern history. It's without fail the most challenging time to be the local church in modern history with everything that's going on. But what if our whole mission is to hold the ground for the next generation, to not turn the lights out on the church, to make sure that there is always a place for future disciples to come home to? What if that's our sole mission? Could we do it? Let me put it this way and close with this. Jesus in Scripture says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Others have come before you. Others will come after you. But this is your day. If God's kingdom is to manifest itself right now, it will have to be through you and I. This is our day. This is our time. God himself will not come back and take our place. We are on a mission from the creator of the universe, the father of lights. And none of us, none of us get to ride in the wake of another person's faithfulness. This is what it means to be a disciple. It is our time to show up and to stand up and to shine. I have discovered that being salt and light is about showing up. It is about consistency and continuity of faith for others to see flavorless salt, hidden lights, 
are worthless to Jesus. They are of no use. God, church, God has given us influence. How are you going to use it? God has given you influence to make a difference in this world. How are you going to use it? God did not create you to just survive this world. He created you to change it. So I pray this week we will see ourselves as salt and light, very change agents of the broken world we live in. Church, I love you so much. I'm so honored and thankful to be your pastor. Thank you for being with us today. I look forward to being with you next Sunday. Love you, church. Thank you.